ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಮಸ್ಕೃತ್ಯ ನರಂ ಚೈವ ನರೋತ್ತಮ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವ್ಯಾಸ ತೋ ಜಯ ಮುದೀರೇತ್ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ Hare Krishna so we are continuing our discussion or rather concluding our discussion of the second canto this evening and what we will do is basically complete the remaining verses and then we will take up some questions and then resolve any other doubts that one may have in the second canto so far that we have done the subsequent week we will begin with the third canto but um i'm trying to see if it would be best for me to summarize the second canto next week and then begin the third canto subsequently so let me take a decision on that but today we will conclude the formal conclusion of the second canto through the verses so we are in the second canto 10th chapter and uh, the previous session i believe we were at 32 verse 32 if i remember right if anybody wants to move to 32 second canto 10th chapter verse 32 they can okay so the most important message that is being conveyed to us in this chapter and which is also going to be conveyed to us throughout the discussion of shrimad bhagavatam at various stages is the message which shri chaitanya mahaprabhu emphasized and chaitanya mahaprabhu's emphasis was to serve the holy names and observe the verse trinadapi sunichena tarori va sahishnuna amani manadena kirtaniya sadahari now how is this chapter or rather the discussion we have been having so far how is it supporting trinada pisuni chena tarori vastahishnuna amani manade na kirtane sadahari first and foremost it is supporting this fact because it is giving us very clear indications in terms of the cause and effect principle that is in motion in the world so for everything there is a cause and then there is also an effect and when you observe the effect or the manifestation of results you will also find the principle of cause embedded into the result so what does it mean it means that every single action is being controlled by the lord and that is being observed at a very minute level in the effect of consequences because there's a certain cause and then there is an effect and the effect when you observe it you are able to see the nature of the cause as well so that fact is being established here now when you understand that everything is practically being managed at some level at some level is connected to the arrangements of the lord inert matter is a manifestation of the external potency of the lord the management of inert matter is his own power the external energy whom we know as maya devi the consort of lord shiva and spiritual direction and management of interaction with devotees is done through his spiritual potency so you practically notice that all kinds of manifestations of interactions are being managed by the potencies of the lord and you can also very minutely examine this analytically which was described in the previous session of dividing the three different manifestations rather you can divide a certain uh, existence into three different aspects one is the adi daivik so there is a controlling deity so every function of the human body is being controlled by a controlling deity the universe is being controlled by different deities at different levels because the universe basically is the macro as we call it the macro manifestation macrocosm of the smaller minute representation which is the human form so if 
the universe, for example, if there is a tide which rises up in the sea, in the ocean, you find that the tide also has an influence on human emotions. So there's a connection between bodies of water in the universe, which is on the planet, and how the bodies of water in the planet are being manipulated by certain energies of the Lord. And you find internal changes occurring to human beings because the human beings are also linked to water. You see, they also have an existence that is mostly water-based. There's water, there's fire, and then there's earth. These are three different elements. We spoke about it in the previous session. And amongst these, the subtle body, which is the mind, intelligence, and false ego, the mind predominantly is water-based. Because it is water-based, the mind controls emotions. The mind basically can be affected. I would say changes that occur in the overall uh, manifestation of the universe. Say, for example, if there is a new moon day, the, there's a, the, the tides in the sea, they have certain functions. You see, there's a new moon day, there's a certain function that happens. In other words, there's a certain manifestation of results in the water bodies around the world that includes also the human beings. And as a consequence, on New Moon Day, it is observed that those who are challenged mentally, they face even greater challenges because there's a lot of disturbance. It becomes even more sensitive. Yeah, This is observed by people, even though they have no belief system in terms of any kind of astro astronomy or astrology or anything like that, you can observe such effects. Yeah, you can observe these effects in the in the lives of people at different um, what do you call it um, the uh, the changes that occur in people during new moon day etc is it's well documented and they do not even have any belief that there is any connection but it's very well documented that on new moon day when people are mentally disturbed in the first place they find it even more difficult to cope with the changes and the emotional turbulence that is felt. At the same time, you'll notice that the seas and the water bodies become quite rough here. Yeah? So there's a link between the water body in the, in the human uh, existence, or rather within us, the content of water. And there is a link between this and the subtle body. That link is, again, the water element, because the mind is actually predominated by the water element. So the link between the gross and the subtle, the commonality, is the water element. Yeah. So the purification of the mind is through mantras. The pacification of the mind is through mantras. Yeah. Similarly, mantras can also have a very, very positive effect on water and the constitution of water and how water can be kept calm. The devas control water through mantras, through the, the, the uh, idea of basically being able to control them through mystical hymns, etc. So there's a lot of control that is being exercised through mantras because water exists in the universe that the water also exists in the body and then the mind also is composed at a subtle level by the water element. Now, the point we are trying to make is that at a very minute level, there's great control exercised by the servants of the Lord and that is Adi, Daivik. And then there is Adhyatmik, which is the Atma, which is us within the body. And we control the senses and we exercise and manifest our control of as you know we use the senses as instruments to experience life to gather knowledge and for us to execute the mission of the lord in certain ways and then there is the adi bautik so the adi bautik is also basically the construct of the body itself the different elements so there are three different ways in which this can be explained the control can be explained one is that we ourselves are part and parcel of the lord then there is Adi Devik, which is the direct servants of the Lord who manage the universe. And then there is Adi Bautik, the material elements, which are also the manifestation of the Lord's external energy. Now, when you have such intricate control, and you also have very basic functions of the human body being controlled by the devas, then you can practically understand that the cause is the Supreme Lord, and the cause can also be seen in the effect. So you can practically observe the manifestation of the cause in the effect once this understanding is obtained. Now, how is this related to Trinada Pisunichena? When one understands that there's a cause and there's an effect and the cause is the Supreme Lord, then one has the ability to tolerate the circumstances of life. One has the ability to accept the consequences of life, which is humility. 
Yeah. So as humble as a blade of grass, we become humble as a blade of grass when we are able to see that the circumstances that are arranged in the universe are controlled very minutely by the Lord. When you understand the sambandha of minute control by the Lord, then we literally allow the Lord to manage our lives. It's very important. This understanding is very important. To the extent to which there's false ego, humility is not possible because the false ego would never allow the living entity to understand that everything is managed by the Lord. So the extent to which there's a false ego, this concept will not be ingrained. It would not be completely absorbed. People would not be able to act upon it. It's very difficult for people to act upon it. But once the concept is absorbed, it is absorbed at a level where there is a greater level of humility, which essentially means that the false ego is also quite absent. And then the true ego is present. True ego is practically the connection that we have with the Supreme Lord as his servants. In other words, when one identifies with the Supreme and understands their specific relationship, then they also have the ability to think through and accept the circumstances of life as being arranged by the Lord. When you have that ability to accept the circumstances of life as being arranged by the Lord, there's even greater faith that is being established and foundation that is being established in Srimad Bhagavatam of how minutely the aspects of life are being controlled. I'm not sure if many of you are aware, the Anushtup mantra, the 32 syllable Narasimha mantra, the Maha mantra, Ugram Viram Mahavishnum, the 32 syllables of the Narasimha Maha mantra actually are associated with 32 different controllers or demigods. That Maha Mantra, which is practically a call upon Lord Narasimhadev, a glorification of Narasimhadev, is also very supportive of the discussion that we have had so far. It's practically a demonstration that the Maha Mantra of Lord Narasimhadev, he is the origin. He is Narayana himself. Lord Narasimhadev is Narayana himself. The 32 syllable mantra, the Maha Mantra of Lord Narasimhadev, Ugram Viram, Every syllable of the 32 syllables is associated with a certain deva and tattva that is being controlled by them. And this is explained in the Narsimha Tapani Upanishad. So it is also explained in the Upanishad where there's a set of verses such as we have just read in the Srimad Bhagavatam in this chapter, which explain that each and every verse of the, each and every akshara syllable of the 32 syllable Ugram Viram Mahavishnu is practically also connected to the Adi Devik aspect, which is actually controlled by the Supreme Lord Narsimhadev. So that connection is being explored in that particular mantra. That particular mantra is practically a combination of 32 aksharas, Ugram, for example, all the different aksharas that form the different words in the mantra. And each of the aksharas themselves have a connection with a specific personality at different levels. So there is the personality of the Gunavatara. So it, it, we talk about Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and Lord Vishnu being the three Gunavataras. So there are syllables associated with them. There are syllables associated with the Shaktis of the Gunavataras, where there's Mother Saraswati, Mother Parvati, Gauri, and Mother Lakshmi. Yeah. And then there are different syllables associated with the main controlling demigods, which are the Adi Devik aspect. That whole mantra, it's broken down in into different aksharas associated with different personalities who manage this universe quite intricately. And all of them are subservient and under the control of Lord Narasimha. So he is Narayana himself. That particular Maha Mantra, which is, it is the Maha Mantra. It was, it was the Maha Mantra of a certain age when Lord Narasimha Dev was the main deity. At that point in time, it was the Maha Mantra. It was the Yuga, Yuga Mantra. It was given by the Lord to chant for the deliverance of the entire yuga. And during that particular time, basically there's a great focus on understanding that the 32 aksharas basically associated with the with different personalities who are all under expansions of and working for the Lord as Narayana, who is non-different from Lord Narasimhadev. 
So this is being explained in the Nasimhatapani Upanishad of the Ugram Veera Mahamantra. And that explanation actually fits in beautifully. So when we do call upon Ugram Veera Mahavishnu, seeking complete shelter of Lord Nasimhadev, knowing fully that he would manifest in our lives and he would completely control the time factor because he is the supreme time. He would practically even change and bring about changes to the time factor. You see, it is very unusual in the Narasimha avatar. It is the only avatar where the Lord deposes Hiranyakashipu and occupies his throne. No other avatar would kill the demon and sit on the throne. You see, but Narasimha Dev, he practically vacated Hiranyakashipu, sat on the throne and then played the role of a father because the father was killed. He wanted to basically play the role of a father to Prahlad Maharaj. Now that Mahamantra and the manifestation of Nasimhadev as a king basically is a message that just as much as the king has control over life and death of, its, of his subjects in the kingdom, the Lord practically is the time factor, is the supreme time factor. He controls Kala. He is the source of Kala. He is the source of strength of Kala. Kala is subservient to Nasimhadev. Kala has to become subservient to Nasimhadev. And that is being seen in the Mahamantra, Ugram Viram Mahavishnu Jolantam Sarvatom. When we do call upon that, then the understanding given by the Narasimha Tapani Upanishad is that every aspect of our existence can be controlled by uttering the names of Lord Narasimha, because practically all the aksharas of the Mahamantra of Lord Narasimha are attributed to the different devas who control the universe. And they all come and uh, the Lord's cooperation to cooperate with the devotee. So they come and they cooperate with the devotee, they cooperate with the Lord. So there's a cooperation between the Adi Devic aspect and the Jiva who is wanting to surrender to the Lord. So the closer and closer one obtains realization of the eternal identity, greater would be the humility. We hear this oftentimes that an advanced devotee is quite humble. Why is it that they are very humble? They are very humble and they are very accepting of the circumstances of life because they understand the cause and effect quite intricately. They understand the cause and effect. They understand that the cause is the Supreme Lord and the effect is also the Supreme Lord. They're able to see Krishna's plan in everything. And as a consequence, they just humble themselves to accept Krishna's plan. But they act upon it. They tolerate the circumstances because sometimes the circumstances do not really um, you know, feel good. Circumstances could be quite intense. One could have diseases, one could have challenges, one could be trapped in certain situations. All of these are very uncomfortable circumstances. But then there's Trinada Pisuniche and Atarori Vasaishnuna, the advanced devotee who has good understanding of who he is or she is in relationship to the Lord, understands that the circumstances they are in is also completely minutely, intricately managed by the Lord through the Adi Devic principle. And also through our Dhyatmic principle, which is the soul himself or herself, is a part and parcel of the Lord, is an extension. So qualitative oneness practically allows the soul to understand the Adi Devic principle. And then there is the Adi Bhautic principle, where matter, which is practically composed of the 16 different elements, in other words, you're talking about the five elements, the working senses, the mind, intelligence, false ego, all of these or also they fall in the category of Adi Bhautik. And these also are completely manifestations of the Lord's potency, even though they may be inert without interaction with conscious energy. Yeah. So the senses at a subtle level are inert without coming in touch with consciousness. That is the point which is, was explained in the previous session by me as to how consciousness impinges upon the inert matter, and then everything begins with that. Yeah. So once we basically are influenced by lower levels of consciousness, then we take on very destructive aspects of our existence. We begin to have a very destructive role in the universe. If we have a far more sublime existence, then we become more aligned with the mode of goodness. If we have the ability to transcend, we, we, we basically attain qualitative oneness with the Lord, then we have the ability to not be touched by matter and not be influenced by matter just as much as the Paramatma is not influenced by 
the body that he is existing in. He is not influenced by being surrounded by gross matter. He is not. He is completely aloof, just as the sun, law, sun god, he manifests his sunshine on even abominable substances, even if they are very abominable, very dirty, filthy substances. They get purified, but the sun does not get affected by coming in touch with them. So in a similar fashion, you know, he is basically a Paramahamsa. In a similar fashion, the super soul is a Paramahamsa. He basically exists you know, in the heart without being contaminated by the surroundings. The soul, when it attains qualitative oneness, also is not contaminated. So coming back to our discussion, the concept of Trinata Pisunichina is to be understood both in principle and also in terms of why. The why part is what is being explained in this particular chapter. The why part is the fact that I explained in the previous session that a sadhu depends on Harinam. Harinam is not different from Krishna. And the sadhu depends on Harinam because that dependence comes from not only an intimate knowledge of the fact that the sadhu is connected to Krishna in different ways in terms of being able to understand the internal connection with the Lord, but also having a much more broader understanding of how the cause and effect in the universe can, is, is basically manifestation of the Lord's potencies in different levels. So there is the cause, which is the Lord, and then the effect is also the Lord. So these two aspects are being explained in great detail in this particular chapter. And it is also dealt with quite elaborately as we proceed through Srimad Bhagavatam. We get to see how the Lord is managing at different levels. We get to see the different Adi Devic aspects, the Adi Bhautic, and then the Adi Atmic. We see all of these as you go further into Srimad Bhagavatam. We see how the rules are being laid down by Manu, how the different Manvantaras basically are manifest and how things work. So all of this is a part of the subject matter of Bhagavatam to inculcate in us the principle that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave us. He gave us a very simple, straightforward verse. Why is that verse so important? Because it practically explains what you need. It explains so many different, very intricate, very, very deeply understood concepts that are a part of an advanced soul's journey. Trinadapi Sunichena Tarori Vasaishnuna Amani Manadena Kirtani Sadahari the yoga between the soul and, the, and Krishna through coming in touch with Nam and serving Nam and calling upon Nam, all of this is being explained in so many different levels by what we see here in this particular verse. It is practically capturing the entire essence of what we need for us to be able to move forward, which is what the Srimad Bhagavatam is going to convey to us in as many examples as possible. It is going to show us surrender and acceptance of the environment in different environments, you know, different people, different uh, circumstances, different devotees and the interaction with the Lord in different leelas. Overwhelming uh, difficulties caused by Adi Devic potencies. So there is a pralaya, there's a mahapralaya, there is a deluge and there is a, 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 the end of the world is being manifested through water. And then the Lord appears as Matsya Dev, and then he is interacting with Satyavrata Muni. He is Satyavrata Manu. He is practically interacting with Manu at that point in time. So now that is practically a difficulty or a challenge caused by Adi Deva. Yeah, the water body becomes so so much. Uh, you know, there's a there's a deluge, and that deluge due to extensive rains is practically being seen as being managed by the Lord as Matsya Avatar. We notice that during the Govardhan pastimes, Govardhan Leela is going to be also a wonderful discussion on understanding in Raja as to how they understand this concept. For them, they don't re really need to understand the Adi Devik, Adi Bhautik, Adi Atmik. For them, there is Sambandha. There's Krishna Sambandha, and for them, Krishna Sambandha means everything. Oh, he is there, he is holding a mountain, and he is holding his, you know, with the left hand pinky. They don't care if they're going to be crushed. They just rush under the mountain because Krishna is there, because there is the eternal Sambandha. You see, in Vraja, they do not operate with all this knowledge of him being the source of all opulences. They do not operate with the knowledge that he is the controller. They operate purely based on the platform of love, where they can't be separated from this boy. Yeah. This boy. If he is going to hold a mountain with his left hand pinky, 
then if something is going to happen to him, I might as well be there with him. You see, it's a very simple, straightforward concept of love that I can't really bear to live separately. I don't have an existence. So everybody rushed under the cover of Govardhan Mountain, Giriraj, when Krishna was holding up with his left hand pinky. So here, there is no analytical reasoning. There is no Sankhya philosophy breaking down why they should rush into danger by going under a mountain held by a small, you know, the little finger, the little finger of a very little boy. You know, Krishna was very young. Yeah, he looked very human. He was extraordinarily, extraordinarily attractive. I mean, we're not going to go into, you know, Krishna being different. Yes, extraordinarily attractive, but a human child. How do you rush under a mountain held up by the left hand pinky of a human child unless you really love him to such an extent that you just simply want to accept any environment that he is in and you want to be with him there? Yeah. So basically, that is being shown in Braja where they don't really analyze all of this. But then the Vaikuntha Lokas, then you have a lot of information about the supremacy of the Lord. In Braja, they don't even care if he is, you know, if he is basically capable of protecting them or not capable of protecting them. They basically are dependent completely on love. So they just go wherever he goes. Yeah. Even Krishna can't understand why they do what they do. He cannot. Even he is under the spell of his internal potency. Even he cannot understand. He will even wonder as to what is this? Why are they doing what they are doing? How is this possible? Why? You know, how is it possible that they are just rushing under this mountain along with me? You know, what, what is made? What are they made of? What's going on in the arts? Krishna doesn't understand fully. Yeah? Because he is under the influence of his yoga maya potency where he's interacting with his devotees because he also needs to be experiencing all this bliss and this wonderful energy of you know, I mean, the wonderful interaction of love that is going on between the devotees and him under the mountain. So the Govardhan Leela is practically also a manifestation of acceptance of circumstances created by the Lord and then acting upon it. They're just tolerating everything and then they go and be where he is. Kirtanya Sadahari, they don't really care about anything else. They just want to be with him. Yeah, they, they, there's no rationality. There is no deep analysis of why someone should rush under the mountain held by a seven-year-old boy. There isn't. They just go because he's there. Yeah. But then the reasons are also being explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The Narasimha Tapani Upanishad explains that the 32 Akshara Mantra of Lord Narasimha practically manages and controls material nature fully. Adi Devik, Adi Bhautik, everything is controlled by the Lord in the Ugram Veera, Mahavishnu, practically. Yeah? You also read about it in the Narayana Upanishad. You read about it in several Upanishads where this glorification of the Lord being the controller and how all the devas, which is the Gunavataras and all the primary demigods who control different aspects of our existence, how are they all connected? That is explained quite clearly in many, many Upanishads. Yeah? So there is no confusion about it. So Srimad Bhagavatam has devoted this last chapter of the second canto, but this is very confidential. It first talks about Sambandha in the previous chapter, and then in this last chapter, they are talking about how even the most minute aspects of existence are controlled by Krishna. Accepting it depends on our advancement. Accepting the fact that who we are today and where we are today is an arrangement of the Lord and having the courage to understand that everything has been given for us to make advancement and to act upon it with courage. That's basically what an advanced devotee does. At no point would someone who is advanced think that something is missing for him or her to make advancement. They would accept the environment. They would accept everything that has been arranged, including the tribulations, all kinds of challenges. And then they would take on these challenges upon themselves fully and act upon it with great courage, understanding very clearly that what was given now and what has been given today is exactly what is required for them to go on to the next level of consciousness. So this is very important for us to understand as well. Yeah, Because sometimes we think that something has to change for us to be able to surrender and accept Krishna's arrangement. The difficulty of people not being able to accept life, as difficult as it may be, I'm not minimizing the fact that some of us face more challenges than others. 
but the idea of accepting the arrangement of the Lord, saying this is exactly the arrangement of the Lord. There's a certain cause, there's an effect. And there's a cause and effect, and I see Krishna's arrangement here. He wants us to experience this because he loves us, and he wants us to experience this so that we could make advancement. Yeah? This particular consciousness is a matter of being able to advance and accept. That is why it's called Trinadapi Sunichena. Mahaprabhu said this is the most important verse. At least our Acharyas said this is the most important verse. Wear it around our head, you know, wear it around our neck so that we could chant Harinam. How will you be able to chant Harinam? Because then you practically have accepted the environment and you're acting upon it with courage. At any given time, you're accepting that the arrangements that have been made have been very carefully made and they have been basically created for our benefit. And then we are able to move forward. Yeah. So this is very important for us to realize. That is why this chapter is very critical. And this is being emphasized throughout Srimad Bhagavatam so that we could accept how different devotees combated different challenges. What was the mindset? What did they do? Yeah, Because there was already a mindset, the Lord revealed his plans and they were able to move forward. So this is the message of this chapter. We want to understand it from the perspective that every minute aspect of our existence is controlled. For us to be able to move forward, we first need to accept it. Our acceptance of this message can happen only because we ourselves have accepted our connection with the Lord and we are moving forward in that connection. Greater the ability of the devotee to recognize who they are, greater would be their ability to accept the circumstances of life. Lesser the ability, lesser the, the knowledge of who they are, greater identification with the bodily existence, greater would be the challenges to chant Harinam. Greater would be the challenges to, you know, the, the greater would be the challenges in chanting Harinam. So that's the whole message. So we need to kind of imbibe this. We need to take it within our hearts of being able to accept that Trinadapi Sunichena is first to be able to accept life. Wake up in the morning and say that everything has been given today. Everything for me to go to the next level of consciousness, whatever is required has been given. I have not really pushed myself to the farthest extent for me to be able to move forward. So my job is to push myself. And if I push myself, then the Lord out of his extraordinary affection and love for me, would make even further arrangements. This is the understanding of a pure devotee. This is the reason why they're called humble. Humility is not so much a function of grubbling on the ground and losing self-esteem and behaving as if you don't have any self-esteem. The pure devotee does not behave like that. There's, not the, there's no reason for us to think that that is what is the standard. The standard is for us to accept life. Yeah, accepting life. Accept it exactly every day in the morning. Today, I've been given exactly what I need. And I'm going to push myself to the farthest extent. And then if the Lord appreciates what is required, then he will increase the resources. You see, he is naturally going to increase the resources. I often give this example. Um, in the material, in the secular world, when you work for an establishment, um, if, if basically, when you work for an establishment, if your superiors see you using your resources very nicely, they increase your resources. It's just quite natural. In a similar fashion, if the Lord observes that we are pushing ourselves to the limit, and then we basically need more, then he will increase the resources. If, on the other hand, we can't use the resources that have been given, regardless of what it is, we don't even accept it fully, and we don't push ourselves to where we ought to be, then what happens is that we basically become emburdened. We become, we start feeling the burden of life. Life becomes a burden if we don't accept it as Lord's, the Lord's arrangement. If you accept it internally, then there would be intelligence that will be provided by the super soul that would allow us to see how to manage life. Yeah, that intelligence would be coming to us as well. It will be very nicely managed because this is the whole principle of Adi Devik, Adi Bhautik, Adi Atmik, is that we are acutely managed. If you're going to be so acutely, so intricately managed by the potencies of the Lord, then where is the challenge? Where is the difficulty? Yeah, He would practically be able to provide anything we need because he understands what is required. Yeah, So he is expecting us to use what is being given to us nicely first, and then he expands the resources as efficiently as one would, 
because he is basically the most efficient. If you want to talk about efficiency, he is the most efficient. His servants are the most efficient. They're, they're very clear on what to do. So this is basically the reason why Mahaprabhu emphasized on Trinata Peace and Ichena. That is the reason why we say that whoever has embraced that verse has the ability to chant is because they accept the circumstances. They keep accepting the circumstances and it becomes the Lord's arrangement. You should try it. Every one of us should try it for a month, two months and record our observations in some kind of uh, you know, diary so that you could basically go back and reflect. We should try and accept saying, yes, I've already been given everything. I've been given everything I need. Now I need to see what I can do to push myself to the maximum. Yeah, this is life. This is exactly what it is. This is exactly how it is. We need to be able to accept things and we need to be able to do our very best with whatever circumstances that we are in. That is very true with spiritual life and the arrangements of the Lord himself. That is being emphasized so clearly in so many different ways. And that is being manifested as well in the results throughout Srimad Bhagavatam so that we develop a deeper level of understanding of how to position ourselves. Okay, so let's get into the verse and we'll just complete the remaining 10 verses. I've already explained it, so I may not give an elaborate explanation. If I do need to comment on any of these, I will. So verse 32, the sense organs are modes of material nature and the modes of material nature are products of the false ego. The mind is subjected to all kinds of material experiences, happiness and distress, and the intelligence is the feature of the mind's deliberation. So in this particular verse, what is being spoken of is the fact that sense organs are attached to the modes of material nature, which essentially means that the sense organs themselves are either very, very powerful and dense when they are in touch with the modes of nature, as in they take control because they themselves are inert matter. So if the sense organs come in touch with the mode of ignorance, to the extent to which they are in touch with the mode of ignorance, to that extent, they become powerful in practically being able to take the soul in a very, very distressful journey towards destinations that are quite destructive. The sense organs, if they are purified by coming in touch with the Lord's service, the sense organs then do not interfere with the soul's journey. They don't interfere. They align themselves with the objective of the Atma. So the Adi Bhautik becomes very aligned with Adhyatmic. And when Adi Bhautik and Adhyatmic are very aligned, then there's a lot of cooperation and facilities provided by the Devas. So this is observed. Yeah. To how to manage the senses, this facility of managing the senses and managing everything is provided by the Devas. The body becomes quite easy to operate if the soul is of a higher level of consciousness. At a higher level of consciousness, there's a lot of cooperation between the soul, the demigods who control the different aspects of our existence, and the senses themselves. Yeah. So the mind is subjected to all kinds of material experiences, happiness and distress. And the intelligence is the feature of the mind's deliberation. So this is again a verse that is talking about how the mind experiences all kinds of material experiences, happiness and distress, to the extent to which the mind is identifying with the senses. The senses themselves are in touch with the modes of nature. So purification of the senses, purification of the mind, practically allows everything else to move forward because they are all now aligned with the adhyatmic existence. Adi Bhautik purified, cooperates with adhyatmic, and this cooperation allows an even greater cooperation from Adi Devik, which are the controllers of the entire material elements and the senses. So it is all a matter of consciousness. Higher the consciousness, greater the freedom, because higher the consciousness, less encumbering are the Adi Bhautik circumstances, which is basically the, the different senses and the elements that we are made of. Less interference. Less interference means more freedom. There's no, no interference at some point. The mind doesn't interfere beyond a certain point. The mind cannot interfere. The mind gets attached to the false ego in the mode of goodness. So how can you resolve issues of the mind? How do you resolve issues of the mind? You need to take the consciousness to the mode of goodness. Only then can you resolve issues of the mind because the false ego 
and the mind, they come in touch with each other in the mode of goodness. When you take yourself, consciousness, back to the mode of goodness, then this false ego can be separated. This is basically the construct. So it's a very, very analytical aspect of bringing consciousness higher, and then you're able to separate things. Verse 33. Thus, by all of this, the external feature of the personality of Godhead is covered by gross forms such as those of the planets, which were explained to you by me. Yeah. One moment. Thus, by all of this, the external feature of the personality of Godhead is covered by gross forms such as those of the planets, which were explained to you by me. So basically, the, the external features of the Lord in terms of the universal form of the Lord having the connection to our own minute bodies and the functions of the minute bodies being controlled by the personalities who are connected to the Lord in his universal form, how he manages the whole uh, you know, a manifestation of material existence. That basically is also not seen. What is seen is you see the planetary forms, you see the planetary bodies, etc. Yeah. So it is covered over. It's more gross. Yeah. There's a subtle manifestation. The subtle manifestation is the devas and the Lord's body, which is the Vishwarupa. And because the Lord desired to eat, then the tongue became manifest. Because the Lord wanted to taste, then taste became manifest. So this was explained in the previous verses. Yeah. That is covered over by the gross manifestation of material nature. Therefore, beyond this gross manifestation is a transcendental manifestation, finer than the finest form. It has no beginning, no intermediate stage, and no end. Therefore, it's beyond the limits of expression or mental speculation and is distinct from the material conception. So here, they have described the universal form. What is the universal form? The universal form is practically uh, the Vishwarupa, as we call it, is a manifestation of the Adi Devic are the Atmic and Adi Bhautic concepts, which are all basically manifesting themselves in the form of the Lord. So multitude of, uh, you know, Devas manifesting themselves. You know, you see the picture in the Bhagavad Gita where you have the different Devas practically manifesting themselves. The body of the Lord basically is the controller. He's spread all over. And that particular manifestation of the Rupa of the Lord is a manifestation of the Adi Devic, Adi Bhautic, Adi Atmic, concept. The universal form is considered to be a material form. Why is it a material form? It is because it is composed of inert matter and how inert matter, which, are, which is being managed by and agitated by the different jivas, which is Adi Atmic, and how they are being managed by the controllers, Adi Devi. When all of this becomes manifest as the Lord's potency in terms of his features, then you have a universal form. That is the Vishwarupa that was shown to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. He practically, Krishna wanted to say that I'm controlling everything in this battlefield, Arjuna. I'm controlling everything. I'm controlling life. I'm controlling death. I'm controlling everything on the battlefield. You do your duty. You accept life as arranged by me because today you are on the battlefield. You are in the chariot. Pick up your arrows. Pick up your bow because I control everything. That is the reason why the Vishwarupa was shown in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. The same thing is being described early on in the Bhagavatam, where we understand that the Lord's potencies control everything. These are separated energies. Yeah. Now, when all of that basically is manifest in terms of a Rupa, then that is the universal form. That is not worshipped by the devotees. Why? Because it's a manifestation that exists in the material world. This verse is saying there's something beyond this manifestation. Beyond this manifestation is what is in the spiritual sky. So then there is the aspect of sublime potency. Sublime potency is that which is above the three modes of nature. Yeah? And then there is the Lord in his personal feature and the different avatars and you know different... Uh, personalities in the different Vaikuntha planets. So that is being described in this verse. So there's a distinction between the two. 
text 35, neither of the above forms of the Lord as described unto you from the material angle of vision is accepted by the pure devotees of the Lord who know him well. Because we don't accept the universal form as the be all end all. We understand that the Lord controls everything, which is the reason why he's showing that form to Arjuna. We understand that that form itself is composed of Adi Devic, Adi Bhautic, and Adi Atmic aspects of how everything is controlled in the universe. Yeah, everything has a feature, everything has a form. Even that particular aspect of the Lord's manifestation of control through Adi Devic, Adi Bhautic, Adi Atmic is manifested in the universal form. We don't worship that because it's a material manifestation. Beyond that, the previous works verse speaks of spiritual energy. We don't really get excited by mere spiritual potency, which is to transcend the modes of nature. Yeah, the sublimity of the spiritual existence is not our goal either. We spoke about it. We will be setting a very low bar if all you want to do is achieve things in this world. You'll be setting a slightly higher but very low bar if all you want to do is leave this world. That's what is being explained in this verse. They're basically saying the devotee is not interested in the universal form because it's a material manifestation. Even though it is a form of the Lord, it is a material manifestation. Neither is the devotee channeling all their energies to experience spiritual energy. They are interested in service. They're interested in relationships. You see, rasa, where there's an experience of relationship, that is our goal. When one has the ability to interact with the Lord in his personal feature, why would they settle for the material aspect where you can control material energy and obtain something? Why would they settle for leaving the material aspect and experiencing bliss here? Yeah? Because it's very limited, low-level bliss, even though it's bliss compared to what it is if one has a relationship and is serving the Lord in that relationship. That is being explained here. He, the personality of God, had manifested himself in a transcendental form, being the subject of his transcendental name, quality, pastimes, entourage, and transcendental variegatedness. Although he is unaffected by all such activities, he appears to be so engaged. So the Lord himself, even though he has made all these arrangements of being a super soul, you know, he comes here and he interacts and etc. That really, he, he doesn't come in touch with material energy. Yeah, he's unaffected by such activities, which means there isn't so, such a thing as karma being created. When Krishna walks on the planet or Lord Rama appears on the planet and they're engaging in activity, when Lord Narsimhadev is practically, um, you know, killing Hiranyakashipu, it is not in the mode of ignorance. This is such a poor concept of understanding. People think it is the material mode of ignorance where he is killing Hiranyakashipu. No, he is not in touch with the material mode of ignorance. Yeah. That is completely transcendental. So that's why it doesn't disturb us to keep a picture of Lord Nashingadev with Hiranyakashipu on the lap with his intestines as a garland around Lord Nashingadev's you know, neck. Does it disturb us? It doesn't disturb us. Why doesn't it disturb us? It doesn't disturb us because it's completely transcendental. Yeah. But the same feature, if it were to be a material manifestation, it would really be disturbing to us because that would be the mode of ignorance. We don't want to understand. We don't want to think that anything to do with the Lord's arrangements and activities here fall in the three modes, which is why here in this verse, they're saying, yeah, none of his activities are material. He's unaffected by all these activities. It's, everything is completely transcendental. O King, know from me that all living entities are created by the Supreme Lord according to their past deeds. This includes Brahma and his sons like Daksha, the periodical heads like Vaivasvata Manu, demigods like Indra, Chandra, and Varuna, great sages like Bhrigu, Vyasa, and Vasishta, the inhabitants of Pitruloka and Siddhaloka, the Charanas, Gandharvas, Vidyadharas, Asuras, the Yakshas, Kinaras, and angels, the serpentines, the monkey-shaped Kimpurushas, the human beings, the inhabitants of Matraloka, the demons, Pishachas, ghosts, spirits, lunatics, and evil spirits, the good and evil stars, 
the goblins, the animals in the forest, the birds, the household animals, the reptiles, the mountains, the moving and standing living entities, the living entities born from embryos, from eggs, from perspiration, and from seeds, and all others, whether they be in the water, land, or sky, in happiness and distress, or in mixed happiness and distress, all of them, according to their past deeds, are created by the Supreme Lord. Text 41. According to the different modes of material nature, the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, and the mode of darkness, there are different living creatures who are known as demigods, human beings, and hellish living entities. Okay, even a particular mode of nature being mixed with the other two is divided into three, and thus each kind of living creature is influenced by the other modes and acquires its habits as well. So particularly, what is being spoken of here is that the modes of nature in the material world are always dominating one over the other. There's something dominating and something else is being suppressed. So in some people, the mode of goodness is dominating, but it doesn't mean that the mode of ignorance and mode of passion doesn't exist. They also exist. In some others, the mode of passion dominates. It doesn't mean the mode of ignorance and the mode of goodness exists. In some others, there's a mode of ignorance that exists fully. Yeah, but it completely dominates the mode of goodness and mode of passion. So what is being spoken of here is that what we see here in the material world is mode of goodness mixed with so many different things. So it's, it's basically a mixture. So there's always a dominance. And the dominance of that particular mode produces a certain kind of body, a certain kind of desire, certain kind of proclivity, of activity. There are so many different aspects which just get driven by the mode they are in. He, the personality of Godhead, as the maintainer of all in the universe, appears in different incarnations after establishing the creation, and thus he reclaims all kinds of condi conditioned souls amongst the humans, the non-humans, and the demigods. Thereafter, at the end of the millennium, the Lord himself, in the form of Rudra, the destroyer, will annihilate the complete creation as the wind displaces the clouds. You know, how easy is it for the winds to move the clouds? So when he appears at the end of creation, which is the end of Lord Brahma's life, he practically destroys this creation. This entire creation is destroyed, material existence. This is before the manifestation of what we would call as interaction of jivas with inert matter. So this is complete annihilation. Yeah. When this complete annihilation occurs, we will read in the fifth canto of how Lord Ananta, slightly being upset, manifests Lord Shiva, and then he expands into the different Rudras, and the Rudras themselves destroy the different levels of existence of the universe. That is being discussed here. The great transcendentalist thus described the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but the pure devotees deserve to see the more glorious things in transcendence beyond these features. Yeah. So here we are talking about, yes, you can describe the activities of the Supreme Lord in terms of managing the universes and creation annihilation and maintenance but the devotees are not very enthused by all of this they want to have personal interactions with the lord there is no direct engineering by the lord for the creation and destruction of the material world what is described in the vedas about his direct interference is simply to counteract the idea that material nature is the creator so there isn't any direct engineering for the creation and destruction there isn't it is being managed by the lord the intelligence is giving bear managed by the Lord. He is not, he does not engage in all of these activities. He practically has facilitated and things are set into motion and the potency of time, the time factor, which exists in the material world, put everything else into motion. So he doesn't interfere. This process of creation and annihilation described in summary 
Herein is the regulative principle during the duration of Brahma's one day. It is also the regulative principle in the creation of Mahat, in which the material nature is dispersed. Here in this verse, there's a description that Karanadaka Shai Vishnu, there are three different levels of creation. The breathing in and breathing out of the Lord as Karanadaka Shai Vishnu. That is called a Mahakalpa. This is a measurement of time. He breathes in, universe has become unmanifest at different degrees, different universes. He breathes out and universe has become manifest. That is called Mahakalpa. Then, when he lies in the Garbhodaka ocean and Lord Brahma manifests from the lotus on the navel of the Lord, that is called Vikalpa. So there's first Mahakalpa and then there is Vikalpa. Then that is called one entire lifetime of Lord Brahma is called Vikalpa. One day of Lord Brahma is called Kalpa. Yeah? One day of Brahma, each day of life is called Kalpa. So Kalpa is one day of Lord Brahma with a thousand yuga cycles. And then you have Vikalpa, which is an entire lifetime of Lord Brahma. And then you have Mahakalpa, which is the breathing in and breathing out of Karunadagashai Vishnu. So basically, um, this is practically extraordinarily what we would call as minutely managed, but then the time factor is mind boggling. Because as we sit and speak today, the higher planetary systems such as the Mahar Loka, Jana Loka, Tapa Loka and Satya Loka, they have been existing. The lower planetary systems, which is below earth and below, they have been annihilated several times. So it is said that when there is annihilation at the end of Lord Brahma's day, then what does happen is that the fire that comes through from to annihilate the lower planetary systems, it makes people vacate even Maharloka and they go higher through a mystic process to escape the heat. But it is fascinating to see that you're talking about billions of years and we haven't even finished one day of Lord Brahma. And we are somewhere around in our own lifetime, which is almost like, yeah, it's, un it's unbelievable. You don't even have the ability to say how, how minuscule and how insignificant our life is in the overall scheme of things, in the overall scheme of things. Text 47. O king, I shall in due course explain the measurement of time in its gross and subtle features with the specific symptoms of each. But for the present, let me explain unto you the Padma Kalpa. So the measurement of time in gross and subtle features that's dealt with in the fifth canto. But in this particular Kalpa, this is called the Shweta Varaha Kalpa. It is the Shweta Varaha Kalpa. It is basically, we, are, we exist in the Shweta Varaha Kalpa, and this is confirmed by Srila Jiva Goswami and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and other Acharyas. And they are basically going to give us what we would call as uh, details of the Kalpa that precedes us. Actually, sorry, the, the Kalpa that we are in. Shavana Karishi, after hearing all about the creation, inquired from Sutta Goswami about Vidura. For Sutta Goswami had previously informed him how Vidura left home, leaving aside all his relatives who were very difficult to leave. Yeah. Now, here there's a conversation going on between Shavana Karishi, who is in the audience of Sutta Goswami. Sutta Goswami was in the original audience when Sukadev Goswami spoke. So now the Katha that is going to start from the third canto is a conversation of what happened to Vidura. Yeah? And this is basically in response to a question raised by Shaunakarishi, who was amongst the audience 
of Sutta Goswami. Shaunakarishi said, let us know please what topics were discussed between Vidura and Maitreya who talked on transcendental subjects and what was inquired by Vidura and replied by Maitreya. Also, please let us know the reason for Vidura's giving up the connection of his family members. Why he again came home? Because it's quite unusual for people to leave and come back. Please also let us know the activities of Vidura while he was in the places of pilgrimage. Sri Sutta Goswami explained, I shall now subjects explained by the great sage in answer to King Pariksit's inquiries. Please hear them attentively. So this original conversation of Sukadev Goswami described the interaction between Vidura and Maitreya Rishi. That particular conversation was heard by Sutta Goswami as Sukadev Goswami described it. And now Saunaka Rishi wanted to hear about it, which becomes the topic of the subsequent chapter, sorry, subsequent canto. So with this, we end the second canto. And it is one of the most, I would say, extraordinarily powerful foundational uh, topics that were dealt with in this canto from the very beginning, actually, from the very beginning. We started out first by understanding that one needs to approach the, sup the universal form of the Lord. Towards the end of the chapter, now we know, towards the end of the canto, we know why the universal form has to be approached if one has no idea of who they are. Because in the universal form, they would be able to see how minutely Krishna manifests and controls everything. So they would develop faith and they would have an understanding about cause and effect. And then the next chapter spoke about approaching the super soul who is in the heart, the Paramatma, and how the yogi needs to purify the subtle body and then raise their consciousness to be able to view and have, you know, a darshan of the super soul and meditate on the super soul for their attainments. Then we spoke about the idea of how and what the differences are between Mishra Bhakti and pure devotional service, which is actually the foundation of the verse Anya Bilashita Shunyam, Jnana Karma Di Anavritam, Anukuliena Krishna Anushirinam Bhakti Ruttama. The concept of foundation of that verse comes from the early part of Second Canto as well. It is established in several aspects of the Srimad Bhagavatam, but it is more seen in the Second Canto. Then different types of bhakti are described by Srila Sukadev Goswami. Then we talk about the fact that the Lord is personal and how the personal form of the Lord differs from the uh, universal form and it differs from the super soul as well. Then there's a description of the three purushas. Yeah. And then there is the question and answer between Lord Brahma on how he basically conducts his affairs and what happened with him when he came and he became manifest through you know, the navel of Srila Garbhodaka Shai Vishnu and the conversation between Lord Brahma and Narad Muni, where Lord Brahma practically gives us a process of Vidhi Bhakti because he is Vidhi. He is a follower of Vidhi and he basically follows, you know, he's basically, um, you know, elaborating on the concept of Vidhi in that particular chapter and talks about how he had to follow the concept of engaging in tapasya because he heard the word tapaha and after he heard the word tapaha, he engaged in thousand years of chanting of the Gopala Mantra. After engaging in thousand years of chanting of the Gopala Mantra, the Lord's personal form was revealed. When his consciousness, he attained the consciousness of being able to see the Lord and have darshan of the Lord, he also understood the Lord's desires. So the blueprint of what the Lord desired of him was revealed. We also spoke about how raising our consciousness to the level of Lord Brahma, which is in the Satya Loka, which is higher the level of consciousness, greater our ability to understand the plans of Krishna, greater the level of Sambandha, greater would be our ability to practically engage in Abhideya. Abhideya, which is activity in service of the Lord, requires Sambandha. Without Sambandha, one cannot engage in service. Yeah. So how is that Sambandha obtained? That becomes basically the topic of Lord Brahma's exchange with Narad Muni. And then finally, after answering all the questions raised by Sri Narad Muni, Lord Brahma begins this creation again because he's satisfied with the example. Now, what did the Lord instruct him? 
the instruction that was given to the Lord is given in four verses, which is the gist of Srimad Bhagavatam. That is seen in the Chatushloki of Srimad Bhagavatam in the previous chapter, 2.9. And the Chatushloki of Srimad Bhagavatam practically establishes Sambandha. It establishes the whole concept of Sat, Chit, and Ananda at different levels. And it talks about the fact that there's Narayana in the beginning, Narayana in the middle, Narayana in the end. Then the Lord says that if there is activity that is engaged in, which is not connected to me, then that activity surely meets with destruction. Basically, we talk about activity and how to align activity with the Lord. And then we speak about how one can remove themselves from influence of matter, because there's the third verse. And then the fourth verse practically says that if you are after Ananda, which is ultimately the quest of the soul, because the soul is a pleasure seeker by nature, the soul is seeking pleasure, but what is the quality of Ananda? Ananda requires Sat, which means you need to associate with one who is eternal, which is established in the first verse of, of uh, Chatushloki. Um, ananda requires Chit, which is Sambandha Gyan, because without Sambandha, one will not engage in the activities that are aligned with the Lord's mission and the Lord's desires. Yeah, so it is Chit. Chit is practically knowing who we are. And then Ananda, which is described in the fourth verse, which is the absolute truth, it requires knowledge of Sat. It requires the ingredients of Sat and Chit. Yeah, Ananda requires, pure bliss requires Sat and it requires Chit. Only then can one say it's, uh, it's absolute by nature. Otherwise, it's temporal. It's relative. Yeah, one could say that I'm happy with you know, a few hours of pleasure. One could say I'm happy with a few minutes. You know, these are all very variegated relative concepts of Ananda. But then for Ananda to be absolute, then you need Sat, you need Chit, you need both. That is explained in the Sambandha. That is explained in the Chatur Shloki. Yeah? And then we finally come to this chapter, which talks about the 10 different topics of Srimad Bhagavatam. And the topics themselves are interspersed. Raka either due to the Lord's manifestation and his different leelas or through the fact that he, basically there are inferences that are being made, yeah? And different kinds of uh, stories that are being uh, told. And we also hear in the same chapter that because the discussion of the 10th canto, which is Krishna's appearance and activities, is the focus of Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. He, that is the focus, the most intimate aspects of Krishna's existence, the absolute truth where Krishna plays in Raja, that is being discussed in the 10th canto. But for us to help us understand and to approach the 10th canto, you know, the remaining different manifestations of Krishna's avatars are also discussed, where we understand his interaction with the devotees, we are able to examine the different topics of Srimad Bhagavatam, and we finally are deeper and deeper in our Sambandha, and then we reach the 10th canto for us to be able to fully absorb ourselves in the glories of the Lord as described in the 10th canto. So there is a certain step-by-step -step process through which we approach the 10th canto as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. If, I have any, if you have any questions, I can take some, and then we will begin either with a summary, I'll decide on it, or we will begin with um, what we would call as, um, you know, we would just begin with the third canto. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you so much. Very nice class. Um, I have two clarifications questions and last week's question I remember now. Um, I'll come to the clarification. You spoke about uh, Narashima Ugram Viram Maha, you know, that, that Maha, Maha um, Mantra, Narasimha Maha Mantra. My question is, what is the difference between the Ugram Viram Maha Vishnam Jalatam, that mantra, and the other one, which is uh, Narasimha Kavacham Stotram, which is Narasimham Kavacham Vaksham. What, what is the difference between the two in terms of chanting and understanding of the mantra for our day-to-day uh, -day life protection? Sure. Um, I think I can answer this. See, the first point is that the Ugram Viram Mahavishnu Chalantam Sarvatomukam, that particular mantra, I would not recommend that that should be chanted by everyone. Yeah, I will not. Um, mm -hmm. The same mantra has its effects nicely distributed in the form of prayers in the Kavach. The Kavach is far more effective and safer to do because what does happen is that the intense appearance of the Lord 
in our lives. Lord Nasimadev is very intense. And if you notice the circumstances of his appearance during Srila Prahlad Maharaj's uh, um, pastime, the circumstances where he practically uprooted everything and then everything had to start afresh. A lot of devotees will have such experiences and not many would be able to cope with such experiences <laughs> if there are massive changes that occur. So it's not exactly appropriate for everybody to chant Ugram Viram Mahavishnum Jolantam Sarvato Mukam. Yeah, it is not appropriate. What is more appropriate and a safer way to approach Lord Nasimadev is through Kavach because we are approaching Lord Nasimadev in the footsteps of his devotee, Prahlad Maharaj. So that is the proper way to do it. So the Brahmanda Purana has the Kavach mantra, which is practically a rendition given by Prahlad Maharaj. When I offer the Narasimha mantra to devotees, I encourage them to chant the mantra given in the fifth canto, 18th chapter, verse 8. That mantra, the Lord manifests himself in the heart. And because he is manifesting himself in the heart, the changes that occur do not occur to the lower chakras. I'm giving a little bit more technical aspects of this, is that the lower chakras in the subtle body, they manifest or they're directly connected to our worldly existence. And mantras that affect the lower chakras can affect our surroundings. They can affect relationships. They practically change everything. That's why Ugrana Shingadeva is supposed to be worshipped by Brahmacharis. Ugrana Shingadeva is supposed to be worshipped by the sannyasis. That is why Lakshmi Narasimhadeva is the only form that is worshipped by the grastas. That is the recommended form. Even that very carefully. Your Guru Maharaj, His Holiness Bhakti Charu Maharaj is very careful about having devotees worship the deity form of Lord Narasimhadeva. He was very careful. Yeah, I've had this conversation with him. I remember once. And the point which I'm trying to make here is that there can be manifestation of a lot of changes if there are mantras that are associated with the lower chakras that are chanted. Yeah. So Lord Masim, Nasimadev's mantras are associated with complete change. So you have to be very careful in taking on the more fierce forms of Lord Nasimadev, worshipping them, chanting the Ugram Viram, etc. The Mayapur Nasimadev, whom we see, the Nasimadev in Mayapur, even though he's extraordinarily fierce, in manifestation, his form, because he is manifesting his potency and he is practically appeared in Gaurangadam, he has the mood of Lord Chaitanya. As a consequence, he is very much like Lord Chaitanya, very approachable. Yeah, he very much facilitating the devotees in the journey and the chanting of Harinam. But in general, in the other traditions, such as the in the other traditions, such as um, what we would call as the Sri Sampradaya and the other Sampradayas, they're very careful in worshipping the Simadev uh, in, in his more fierce forms. And, you know, in our devotees, basically, they worship and they're, in fact, very comfortable simply because he has the mood of Lord Chaitanya, extraordinarily benevolent. And the Simadev is like that as well. He's very, very extraordinarily, uh, I would say, quick to respond to devotee prayers. But there are certain rules and regulations which we should never neglect because the appearance of the Lord is fully present in his mantras, and all kinds of changes can occur. Not everybody can cope with these changes. A brahmachari, for instance, wouldn't mind moving from one temple to the other. He wouldn't mind being on a book distribution van for three months and engaging in, you know, cooking in the behind the van and eating, you know, kichri every day. This is Sankirtan devotees. They do it all the time. Yeah. Sannyasis, they travel all the time. So there's instability. Grahasthas can't do that. So the grahasthas, they are better off doing the kavach. They are also better off reading the mantra from 5.18.8, because there, the manifestation of the mantra occurs in the heart chakra. It's above the lower chakra. So it's basically the Lord manifests himself directly into the heart. Yeah. So we don't want to ignore intricacies of what has already been shared in the Shastra. We don't want to ignore things that are known to others, you know, in defiance. So sometimes we don't want to say that it is okay, the Lord will not do. We don't want to do that because we already know it, approach him, in his more approachable form as Lakshmina Simadev, where he's completely pacified. Prahaladana Simadev, he is completely pacified. You know, not Ugrana Shingadev. It's very different. I hope this answers your question. Oh, very comprehensive answer. Thank you. Uh, the other one, again, was a clarification from the class, just understanding furthermore. You mentioned Mahaloka, Tapaloka, Janaloka, and Satyaloka. And the lower planetary system and the inhalation effects sometimes. Mm -hmm. My understanding, so does that mean that these four planets are 
eternal. They don't, only the lower planets go through annihilation. They are, I know the spiritual planets beyond them, beyond these are the spiritual planets, which is three fourth of, so these planets are also eternal is my question. Which means the higher planets. No, they are not. They are just, Maha. they exist. Yeah, the Maharloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, Satyaloka, they exist um, throughout Lord Brahma's life. But yeah. the end of Lord Brahma's day, the lower planetary systems get annihilated. At the end of Lord Brahma's life, everything goes. So that which means uh, end of Brahma's life, Mahaloka, Tapa, Jana and Satya will also get annihilated. Yeah, yeah. the sages, uh, you see, for example, in Maharloka, as we speak today, uh, there are deity forms who exist there. Yeah, there are sages like Brigu who exist there. There are great personalities who have incarnated, the Lord's incarnations also there, are there in Maharloka. So the point being that when there's the end of Lord Brahma's days, you're talking about billions of years, they move up to Satyaloka. At the end of basically Lord Brahma's life, then they go from Satyaloka to the Vaikuntha planets, etc. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah, so they are not, these locus are not eternal. I, um, from uh, understanding, the lower planet annihilation takes more than the higher planets. Is it fair to understand like that? Every day, yeah. Annihilation is every day at the end of Lord Brahma's day. And then so it's during... The same. It's the same. Annihilation, when annihilation happens, end of Brahma's day, all of the planets go, which is the lower and the higher. Um, no, just okay. lower. Earth okay. and below, Swarga and below, Maha, everything below Maharloka goes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and the next one is the yeah last week's question. I mean, I can wait for others to ask and then come back. Um, we'll see. Um, yeah, I have a few questions from others, so why don't I just touch upon it? Yeah. And then we'll you can ask again. You you should you, when I when I'm done, you can ask and you can come back on. Line. Yeah, it's the last week's class. Remember, I had the question and I forgot the question. So I remember now. Okay. Okay. Sure. No problem. Um, so there's a question here. Is cause and effect the same as action and reaction? Um, the cause and effect is, I wouldn't really say that you could apply it in the same way as action and reaction. The cause and effect practically here to be is to be understood that since the Lord is um, the controller of at the level of the minutest of our existence, then the effect and the manifestation of different aspects of what we see in this world are also contained in, you know, they also have the Lord's will in them. You can say in one sense, you can understand the Lord's will because he controls everything. So since he didn't stop it, it is acting. So that is how you understand cause and effect. While action and reaction, it is applicable more in terms of um, karma, where one performs a certain kind of action and then one experiences a certain kind of reaction on the other end. So it's a different uh, concept altogether. Yeah. So in that sense, most people wouldn't even know what they're experiencing. They can't really see what the original action was of why they're experiencing what they're experiencing. So in that sense, you can't really have a direct comparison between the two. The former is to establish the fact that because he is in control of practically the minus, minutest aspect of our existence, either directly or indirectly, the effect of is also seen. In other words, whatever we see here is also connected to him. That is what the cause and effect principle is. Action and reaction, on the other hand, is the concept where someone does something for which they experience something else. So it's a little bit different. Can the effect of past actions be reduced by any chance? What is the mantra for this? The Maha Mantra is the most, most profound and safest, most powerful mantra, which is supported by Krishna as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in this yuga. The deepest level of cleansing of everything that exists in the past is done by chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It is the yuga mantra. And that is the mantra that is also supported by the parampara. It is supported by Lord Chaitanya. So I would encourage you to take up the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, which is the Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. Then, you, you know, past action can definitely be changed. Why do the modes affect different people to a different extent? Is it due to past and current karma? 
The answer is yes, because when we use the word Adi Bhautik, the Adi Bhautik is how the senses and how the different aspects of who we are are also manifesting. So sometimes the senses are defective and people of a defective senses, they perceive the action of the modes differently, while someone with you know, uh, a more, I would say, uh, much better ability then can manage those aspects. Say, for example, someone with some kind of a diseased body part would find it more difficult to be in a bad climatic situation than one who is healthy. So there definitely is an effect of interaction with the modes and karma. How can consciousness be molded to see everything in relation to the Lord? Uh, it, there isn't uh, an artificial process. We are constantly coming in touch with Krishna through his names, through Srimad Bhagavatam, through the devotees, through the Dham, through the deity form that practically facilitates the molding of consciousness. So there really isn't an indirect process. It's a very direct process, devotional service, very directly. How do you see everything in relation to the Lord? As consciousness goes higher and higher, then one has the ability to accept life as arranged by the Lord to a larger extent. And this is what I explained by Trinada Pisuni Chena. And when one has that higher level of consciousness with greater sambandha, and they have a deeper understanding of everything that's been arranged, then they also have a deeper understanding of, you know, um, what we would call as um, uh, uh, seeing everything in relationship to the Lord. As human life is rare and short, my understanding is that like in the previous yugas, kings renounce at the end of their life. But for the Kali Yuga soul, we need to cultivate devotion and renunciation at the current moment. Yeah. Um, it is not so much life is rare and short. In the previous yugas, a lot depended on sadhana because lifespan was long, the environment was the mode of goodness. You could, you could walk a few miles away from where you live, and then you could be in a forest, which is essentially undisturbed. You could see heavy presence of demigods in the forest. You see that throughout the Bhagavatam, different demigods manifest themselves. So there was greater access because the consciousness was higher in the environment, and the lifespan was longer. A lot depended on the practitioner. In this yuga, because so many things are difficult, we are more dependent on mercy. So the whole objective of sadhana bhakti is to position ourselves so that we could receive more mercy. So we should view this existence as receiving more mercy, positioning ourselves for mercy. So that's why there has to be work towards trying to position ourselves for a greater level of mercy. Yeah. How do you position ourselves for mercy? We practically rearrange and basically understand that we are dependent. We are dependent on the Lord. So this is greater level of Trinada Peace that is required, greater level of humility. And that practically arranges for everything in this particular yuga. Yeah, it is mercy that we require. We say a simple devotee, a simple devotee in the sense that, you know, if someone has a very simple thought process and they're able to accept things and they're able to do things nicely, then it is not their sadhana. It is simply that they are positioning themselves in such a way that they are not committing offenses and they are not agitating others, but they are basically positioning themselves to be picked up. That is what is to be understood. We need to do that. Does cause and effect then mean that everything has been prearranged by the Lord? Cause and effect means that one should understand that everything is connected to the Lord and therefore one should depend on him. That is what one should understand. The here, the idea, and you should, if you go back to the previous class, in the previous class, I've spoken about dependence on the Lord. You should, you should, if you go there, you will practically see the definition of a sadhu is to depend on Harinam, depend on Krishna. So how do you depend on Krishna? You depend on Krishna when you receive a higher level of Sambandha, when you are in love with him, and you're surrendered, your existence to him, then you're completely dependent on him, like the Vrajvasis. Then there is also a more analytical approach of understanding where one understands that everything has been arranged by him and as a consequence, we accept our existence. So that's what this is. 
dependence on the Lord, not so much to just understand that everything has been prearranged. It means that everything is connected to him, therefore we depend on him. That would be a more useful understanding. Okay, any other question or comment, please? Prabhu, can I ask my question? Yes, you can, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the question is on the gross manifestation of the material nature. I'm looking at text 17, we read last week, the living force being agitated by Virat Purusha generated hunger and thirst. Mm. So, and then further on, it says from the mouth, the palate becomes manifested and therefore the tongue was also generated and this all the different tastes came into existence so that the tongue can relish them mm -hmm. and then i'm looking at 26 thereupon for sexual pleasure begetting offspring and tasting heavenly nectar the lord developed the genitals and there is the genital organ and it's controlling deity prajapati so my question is i'm going to pay the devil's advocate here uh, my question is, looks like it's a hardware. It's like a manufacturing defect where you have hunger, thirst, you have God, has, Krishna has already created tongue and with all the desire. So when you, I mean, if you look at these three things are the fundamental things, hunger, thirst, and sexual desire. These three cannot, it seems like it's a, not a software issue, it's a hardware, you know, it's a circuit problem. So software can be conscious, okay. we can dovetail it, we can dovetail our things, but it's coming from the hardware. It's chemicals and hormones that are triggering, triggering all these things. And I think it's sometimes beyond us because it's, it's an integrated, you know, hardware. No, sure. See, the point is, um, I would say that um, from the concept of what you just explained, um, it is not a hardware issue. It is not a hardware issue because someone else could be in the same body and they may not experience the challenges posed by the physical body. It is definitely an issue only of consciousness. And consciousness is not software, it's not hardware. It is basically life. Because what I'm trying to say is that if you were to say the subtle body is the subtle senses, and then the gross body is the gross senses, there can be devotees who are basically of a higher level of consciousness and of a higher level of consciousness, they just are not trapped by these needs. This is basically uh, a fact. They are not trapped by these needs. They are not really trapped and entrapped by these needs. They have the ability. They have the ability to develop a higher taste and higher existence, and then they are not really, um, I would say, uh, uh, struggling with all of these. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's a consciousness issue, which is the reason why. There's inert matter, and when inert matter is impregnated with consciousness, and there are three modes of nature. Consciousness can be in different combinations of three modes of nature, with one mode dominating over the other. When the lower modes are dominating, at that point in time, the needs of the senses become very prominent. When the higher modes are dominating, then the living entity has the ability to discriminate and the sublime intelligence comes in where they are able to reject unwanted interactions and they are saying, I'm not interested in this because this is just very mundane. So this interaction is all a matter of consciousness of higher to a lower level of interaction with the modes of, it, modes of nature. That's what this is. So it is not a hardware issue. In one sense, you can say it's all inert matter and that is what it is. But, but no, consciousness, sorry. sorry. Krishna seems to have created this. Krishna seems to have put all this in the human beings. Why did he do that? Which one? No, he has not. He has given equal opportunities. He is not merely given someone one kind of body while well, he's given someone else. He's basically saying that if you want to remember me, I will help you remember me. And to help you remember me, I will remove all the obstacles, even if you are within a body which is inert, which is made of gross matter. If you want to forget me, I will help you forget me. This way you will identify with the body and you will engage in it. Krishna has not made this arrangement. It is practically the jiva's desires, which is explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the same chapter, that the kind of body we receive, whether we receive the body of a demigod 
whether we receive a body of a great personality, a sage, or we receive the body of, you know, someone like a hog, which is completely enamored by its senses. This is all a matter of desire. And desire is basically a matter of, you know, us being able to desire certain things and we get a body for us to express our desires. This is basically what the whole idea is. Then as the desires change in the human existence, then we receive finer bodies, which give less trouble. Yeah. And then that is what we call, you know, for example, a Brahminical body is highly dom dominated by the mode of goodness. Now, when I use the word Brahminical body, I'm talking about not by birth, but by guna. Someone who has got a very Brahminical disposition, they are existing in the mode of goodness as a consequence. They are not as disturbed by the senses as someone who is in the lower modes. So we have received our bodies and all of this has been arranged purely because we have desires to fulfill. And Krishna is giving us yantras, machines, for us to be able to fulfill those desires. When we have no more desires, or rather our desires are completely transcendental, then we don't need any of these bodies. We go higher and higher in existence. So the gross body is given up, and then we get the subtle body. You know, the devas have a more sublime, subtle body. The higher the nature of the devas, the greater and the greater you know, the more subtlety that's observed. Not everybody can see Lord Brahma. Yeah, the devas have to have a higher consciousness. One may be able to see a lower level functionary, but they can't really see the king easily. Yeah, so one can't really see who is behind all of this, the Supreme Lord, unless they are in that consciousness. So it's a matter of consciousness and opportunity. Yeah, so we are in the business of arranging for not coming back into gross bodies that are problematic and to be born in an environment that encourages devotional service and to develop a higher taste. That's what we're in the business of. We're trying to basically create a future. And you can see the creation of future whilst being in this lifetime. You don't need to wait for leaving the body. You see, when we started out with devotional service, we had a certain kind of consciousness. Within a matter of few years of coming in touch with Harinam, uh, the prasadam, the devotees, the Lord, Dham, our taste has changed. Our body has changed because the body keeps changing. Our body has changed. The two body that we have today is not the body that we came into the movement with. Sometimes people change. They look different after a few years in devotional service. There's a reason for this because the consciousness basically has changed and the body has changed and then we are interacting with it. The changes to the body themselves are minuscule. We don't really observe it, but cellular change is occurring and this is you know, a scientific acceptable fact as well. So as a consequence, what I'm saying is that's constant change and we are heading towards a situation where we are not going to be bothered by these changes. That, you know, we are not going to be bothered by the body. So it is a matter of consciousness. It is not just a matter of being in a circumstance. And this is what I explained in the previous session, that in the sixth canto, we will see the great personality, Vritasura, who appears in the body of an Asura, a demon, but he speaks of transcendental devotional service because he was a great devotee in the past. So there's great ability to not be affected by the body because of devotional service. We are going to see that as well. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice explanation. Sure. Thank you. Any, any other question or comment, please? Anybody else? Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Please accept my humble obeisances. What lovely is Krishna Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, Prabhuji, thank you, first of all, for such a beautiful uh, class and wonderful question answers. I just have the basic question, which somehow has never, I have got this crystal clear answer to it. Uh, it's like, uh, we follow Mahaprabhu's mission, which is uh, following Rajabhakti, Rajabhav. But at the same time, as Prashila Prabhupada says, you know, that first we should know the supremacy of Krishna and then we can come on to the sweetness of Krishna. So this seems, you know, a little different to me, like how knowing the supremacy of Krishna, like if we know that Krishna is everything, he is the cause, he is the effect, he is everything, he is supreme, then how can we develop that Raja love, that Raja Bhakti for him? Wouldn't be that impediment to our Raja Bhakti? Um, okay, so it's a good, very good question. The point is as follows. The, as we progress further in, first and foremost, accepting the Lord's arrangement, which is the cause, the effect, and him being the controller, 
is the first step in going forward, which is what I explained to you earlier on. The second canto starts with accepting his arrangements, starts with the Purusha avatars, etc. Now, formal worship of the Lord as Sri Sri Lakshmi Narayan. Prabhupada used to say, worship the Lord as the Lord of Vaikuntha because it's very formal. We do that in our temples. Yeah, we follow Vidhi. We have procedure. We have to follow, you know, time. We have to be very, very careful about everything. So that's basically, there's a lot of Vaikuntha type of interaction, accepting Krishna as the Supreme Lord and serving him in that capacity and understanding he is the Samam Bonam. He is the origin. He is the end. He is the middle. That is definitely there. But what happens is, when you come in touch with Krishna in his deity form, when you come in touch with Nam, it purifies our existence and gives us Sambandha Gyan. That Sambandha Gyan is a very sublime experience of knowing who we are in relationship to Krishna. When that happens, it's like an automatic transformation from identifying with the Lord in his form and being very formal with him to an understanding of who we are in relationship to Krishna. The formality of interaction should not stop externally. You should still worship the deities formally because you need this to develop even more. You want to cultivate it. So when you worship the deities at the temple, you do the Sorash Opachar, you do all the Opacharas as you have been instructed very carefully. This would purify us and give us the ability to overcome our anarthas Nashta prayeshu abadreshu. When that occurs and we are in nishta, where we become fixed in devotional service at a higher level of consciousness, which is the higher level of mode of goodness, which is not, you know, which is very, very minutely impacted by the lower modes. At that point in time, we position ourselves to receive information about who we are in relationship to Krishna. That information is also organic. It is as organic as what you experienced when you first came in touch with knowing who your spiritual master was. It is as organic as what you experienced after being initiated and becoming a part of a spiritual family. It's very organic, those experiences. When those experiences themselves have taken you from who you were, a practicing bhaktin, to someone who is with a spiritual master, then integrating with his God family, which is you know basically having God family, God sisters, God brothers, etc., which is practically another layer of identity. In the same manner, the transition from Formally serving Krishna as a Supreme Lord and the Samam Bonam and all of this would occur quite nicely and smoothly and organically at the appropriate stage where you will receive information about who you are in the spiritual sky. It is an extraordinarily well-documented process by our Acharyas. Different people have experiences which are similar, not necessarily the same, but they're similar. So that's the answer to your question, is that it does not interfere. And the idea is that you continue serving formally because internally you enjoy the relationship. Externally, you stay formal. That is how it should be managed. Internally, you practically serve the Lord in as much as you can in the, in the, with the idea of who you are in, his, uh, uh, in the relationship in Raja. Externally, you continue following the formality as seen by others. This is what our Acharyas did in Vrindavan. You hear about the six Goswamis fasting. You hear about the six Goswamis doing dandavats. You hear about the six Goswamis chanting X number of rounds. You see, doing parikrama. Now, were they required to do all of this from the perspective of who they were in the spiritual sky? The answer was no. They were already serving the divine couple in their original conception. Externally, they were worshipping and acting as practitioner devotees. We need to learn to follow in their footsteps to receive results. That is the reason why Srila Prabhupada wanted us to be formal and worship the Lord as Lakshmi Narayan. So we are very formal and we are able to understand and appreciate the connection that we have with the Lord, which is exactly what we see in the second canto. We are taken step by step and shown who the Lord is in our relationship. And then we are also being given a lot of information later on as we make advancement naturally about who we are. It's a natural occurrence. In our movement, that natural occurrence of who we are in relationship to Krishna will happen when there's service done in Mahaprabhu's movement. It will come through the mercy of Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu himself will reveal everything. Yeah, it will happen because we are serving him. That is how mercy is to be earned in our movement. We should serve the spreading of Harinam.
and then we become qualified to receive. When Mahaprabhu then will give us, you know, mercy, through that mercy, then we will understand our relationship with the divine couple. And then internally, we serve them in the capacity as we chant Nam, and also when serving the deities, externally, everybody sees us following rules and regulations. This is how it was done by the Goswamis. Yeah? Does it make sense? Yes, yes, definitely, Prabhu. I'm so grateful and so thankful that I asked this question to you. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any other question or comment before we move on? I can take one more question if you have any. Okay, so we end today's session and we'll meet again the following week. I'll make a determination as to whether um, we should start with the third canto or do a summary again. I think we have touched upon the summaries quite adequately. We may just want to start with the third canto and we will also kind of draw upon what we have learned as we go along the third canto. I think that may be more efficient. Um, good, so we'll meet again. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.